Hello and welcome to lecture six of our introduction to machine learning course. Today we're going to talk about linear discriminant analysis, which is another linear classification method in addition to logistic regression that we discussed last week. So, in fact, there are several different ways to approach the linear classification problem. For example, if you open the Elements of Statistical Learning, which is one of the textbooks that I always recommend, um, you will find a chapter called Linear Methods for Classification. And in this chapter, it consists of three parts. One part is about logistic regression, another part is about linear discriminant analysis, and the third part is called Separating Hyperplanes and talks about methods like Perceptron and um, Linear Support Vector Machines. This is interesting because the previous chapter is called Linear Methods for Regression and it only talks about linear regression. Um, in fact, I don't have a very good answer why there are more approaches to linear classification than to linear regression and part of that might be just tradition. Um, or in, to, to some extent it could be that the fact that, our predict that the variable that we're predicting is categorical allows um, the several natural approaches. We talked about logistic regression last week and there the, the point, the whole point of logistic regression is to model the probability of each class given an observed data. Given some predictors, uh, you're predicting what is the probability that this is class 1, for example, as opposed to class 0. Here in linear discriminant analysis today, we're going to primarily model distribution of the data given a class. We will discuss exactly what it means uh, in the next slides, but that is the difference here. Um, and in these methods um, that can be called separating hyperplanes, they directly optimize the linear decision boundary without a probabilistic model. So these are not probabilistic models. We will not talk about them in this course just for the lack of time. We would need to have another lecture for that. So here's the same thing as a, as a schematic. And as I said, logistic regression can be seen as modeling class distribution given the, given the data, and LDA can be seen as giving the distribution of the data in each class, given the class. So let's try to understand this difference uh, better. Of course, if we're doing classification, what we're actually looking after, what we're actually interested in, is the probability of each class, if it's a binary classification problem, then probability that it's class 1 and probability that it's class 0 given a data point, given x. This is what logistic regression directly estimates. In this lecture, we will just approach the same thing the other way around. It's a bit of a roundabout way. We will assume some model for each class. It's a probability uh, distribution of x's in class 0 and some probability distribution of in class 1. Assuming this model and assuming some prior probabilities for class 0 and class 1, we can use the bias rule to get to the probability of class given an observed data. And this is what we, what we want, right? So we get to the same object as in logistic regression, but in a, in a roundabout way via the bias theory. Here's how it works. This is the bias theorem written out for you. We have here the object that we want, probability that a given x sample belongs to the class k out of, uh, out of potentially multiple classes. And this is given just by a bias theorem as a probability the other way around, right? What is the probability to observe x given that it belongs to this class times the prior that the class um, uh, the prior probability of class K, and you have a normalization factor in the bottom that just sums over all possible classes the same term. We talked about that in one of the previous lectures. So, in fact, the denominator is not super important if you just want to choose the class, right, because the denominator is always the same for all classes, so if you just want to assign your X to one of the classes, you need to find the class for which the denominator is the largest, numerator is the largest, um, and I will introduce this notation here, so the prior will denote as pi k, that's a prior of class k, and uh, fk of x will be the probability distribution function of uh, the data in class k. You may wonder though in this connection to linear regression or this, this, this analogy to linear regression that I mentioned um, earlier, in 
linear regression, if you go back to one of the first lectures, there we just model probability of y, continuous variable y, given x. And one can think about whether there one can do the same trick, where one can postulate some um, probabilistic model of x given y's, when y is continuous, some prior over y's, and then use the observed data to estimate the most likely y. It's the same roundabout way via the bias theorem. Um, I'm just posing this question here, and we might get back to that in one of the one of the last lectures in this course. Here, in today's lecture, we will be exclusively talking about Gaussian densities. Okay, so the the bias theorem that you saw on the previous slide that relates to any densities. Um, here we're talking about Gaussian densities. So it's multivariate Gaussians because we can have multiple uh, multiple features. Right, and this is the probability density you see written here for a, a multivariate Gaussian. Let's say I will use the letter P that you see here to denote the dimensionality of the predictors. You, this entire thing in the front is just a normalization factor so that this thing um, integrates to one as the probability density should, right? And the in more interesting objects here are the mean, the mu, and the covariance matrix, the sigma. And we can have a separate Gaussian for each class. That's why they are indexed by k over here. So let, here's an example. Imagine we have two predictors. We have x1 and x2, nothing else. And there's three classes. And we, let's assume that we know the true, uh, the true parameters of all the Gaussians. So we know what the mu is, and we know what the sigma is, and we know what the prior is. Um, and um, yeah, here's an example. This is a spherical Gaussian that um, x1 and x2 are uncorrelated and have the same variance. This is, this is uh, here the um, covariance matrix will be diagonal. The variance of x2 is larger than the variance of x1, but there's no correlation, so there's zero off diagonal. And, and, and this covariance matrix um, has some correlation in it. And now you observe a point, let's say here, the star, and you're asking which class does this point belong to? So the bias theorem just tells you how to compute that. If you know all these parameters that are written here as, as Greek letters, and you know the position of this point, you can find out the probability that this point belongs to this class, or the probability that it belongs to this class, and the probability that it belongs to this class, and they will sum to one, right? So in this case, probably it belongs to this class, most likely, right? But you just plug it in here, um, and you compute um, you compute the probabilities. Why do you need the priors? So the prior just imagine that imagine that this prior is very low. What it means is that most of the points come not from this class. This is a very rare class. Let's say the prior is one percent here. This just means that there's very very few points of this class in your data. Whereas let's say here the prior is I, I don't know, 49%, and here's the remaining 50, then actually it will be most likely that this point came from here, right? The probability density maybe is a bit larger for this class, but it's very unlikely that it comes from here because this class is so rare, so it's much more likely that, uh, that this point came from here given the high prior of this class. That's why you need two things. You need the prior and you need the likelihood, right? And then multiplying them together, you get the actual... Uh, probability, the posterior. That's how the bias theorem works. Okay. Um, so now let's let's. That was the conceptual picture. Let's now uh, talk through the math. So we will, for simplicity, I don't want to talk about the priors anymore. So I will just assume that the priors are all the same. This doesn't change math much. Just simplifies it a little bit because we don't need to to um, carry these priors with us. And let's consider binary classification problem. So from now on, actually, throughout this lecture, we'll just talk about the binary problem. There's two classes, okay? And that's, again, the multivariate density. And what is, um, what is helpful to write down is the equation for the decision boundary, so-called decision boundary, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, the line or the hyperplane that separates, or the surface that separates the part of the predictor space where the probability to observe class 1, the probability that the point belongs to class 1 is higher, larger than 50%, and the part 
of the of the space where the probability that the point belongs to class two is larger than fifty percent. Okay. Um, we don't. We talked a lot about this last week. That we don't. If we actually want to do binary predictions, we don't necessarily have to uh, say if the probability to observe one class is over fifty percent, then it's that class. We can. We can. Uh, depending on the on our goals, we might want to reduce the false positives or, you know, increase the the true positive rate and so on. So we we might choose a different cutoff or a threshold see last lecture for, for this discussion. Um, but we will ignore this for now. So let's say our threshold is 50%, and then the decision boundary will be just given by, by this equation. It's whenever the probability of class 1 equals the probability of class 2, that, that point lies on the decision boundary, right? And let's just, just work it out in this case. So here is our density. I'm just saying then that since the prize are the same, it, what we need to do is we just need to equate this with uh, for, for class 1 with the same expression for class 2. And as always, or as often, here we have exponents, so it's convenient to take logarithms. If probability of class 1 equals probability of class 2, we can take logarithm on both sides. That's what I'm doing here, taking logarithm of the whole this entire expression for class 1, I get this factor with 2 pi that just cancels on both sides because it's the same. And then there is this factor in, with determinant of, of the first covariance matrix and the second covariance matrix, but these are just numbers, right? So this is just some constant. If, and then these are the most interesting terms. And this is, this is an equation. So this, this is an equation for the decision boundary. And if you look at it closer, you will see that this is a quadratic function. So this is just a number, this is just a constant, this is another constant. Here, if you open the brackets, whenever you have mu times sigma times mu, this is also a constant. And whenever you have x times sigma times x, that's a quadratic uh, function of coordinates of x. So what is written here is maybe a complicated way through matrices to write down some quadratic polynomial of the coordinates of x. That's why this is called quadratic discriminant analysis. So what we're getting here is, um, and this is, 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 that's a binary problem, right? So we have class one and class two. There is, here's the mean one, here's the mean two. This is some covariance one. There's a different covariance matrix in class two. And then the decision boundary will be a quadratic function. So it's some parabola or perhaps a circle, some quadratic uh, line in this two dimensional plane. But this is not linear discriminant analysis, right? And I promised you that we're going to talk about linear discriminant analysis. So how do we get from, from this QDA that is actually rare, in, in, at least in my experience, it's rarely used in practice. How do we get to LDA, which is used very, very often? And the trick here is to make an additional assumption. So this QDA was a very general setting whenever you know that your class densities are Gaussian, you don't make any further assumptions, then the QDA, quadratic discriminant analysis, just follows from that mathematically. We need to make one more assumption to get an LDA. And this assumption is that the covariance, class covariances are the same. We assume that the covariance matrix in class 1 equals the covariance matrix in class 2. Of course, the means are different. So you have one class sitting here and another class is sitting here. They have different means, but they have the same covariance matrices, right? And then this simplifies a lot. So let's, let's see what happens if I replace sigma 1 and sigma 2 with just sigma. Well, this term cancels out. Great, very convenient. And then you can open the brackets and put everything. Ah, if you open the brackets, the first thing you will notice is that there is a term x sigma inverse of sigma x. And on this side, you have x inverse of sigma x. So this is the quadratic term. That's what makes the QDA quadratic. That's what makes the QDA, the Q in QDA. And this thing will just cancel out because sigma is now the same, right? So it's again great. We cancel the quadratic term. What survives are the linear terms. So here you have x sigma mu 1 and here you have x sigma mu 2. These are different. So we can collect all the terms with x here on the left and all the terms without no, sorry, this is just re the same thing rewritten. Now I can collect all the terms with x here and all the terms without x on the right. So this is just some constant. And 
on the left, we have some function of x, which is actually a linear function. So I will divide by both sides by 2, and then this is the equation of the decision boundary, right? That's what we're computing here. That this is the decision boundary of linear discriminant analysis, and it is linear. So we have x transpose times something, and something is just some vector. So let's, for the moment, we can just think about it as some vector. If you know the sigma and mu, you, you plug it all in and you compute some vector. So what we have here is x times vector equals to constant. This is a linear projection of x onto this vector, sigma inverse of sigma times the difference between the means. Um, and this corresponds to the linear decision boundary. So let's take a look at the picture of how it works. Now, from now on, whenever I draw a picture for the linear discriminant analysis, I will try to draw them such that the covariances are the same, right? Because this is our assumption from now on. So here's class one, here's class two, and the decision boundary is a line. So why, how to see actually mathematically that, so make sure that you understand why it follows from this equation that this is a line. And this is because, so let's take this vector here. Oops, sorry, this vector without x. And it, let's say it points in that direction. So whatever, that doesn't matter. So let's say this is this vector. And now whenever x point is such that I compute the scalar product, we can say that we project this point on this vector and we compute, we compute the product of these two lengths, right? And whenever this is equals to this given number, this is a decision boundary. Whenever it's larger, it's class one. Whenever it's smaller, it's class two. So you project the points here and there's some threshold, and if it's on one side of the threshold, it's class one, and if it's on another side of the threshold, it's class two, so the decision boundary is just a line perpendicular to this vector, right? And crossing it in the point that corresponds to this threshold on the right. So just to make it clear, just to say it again, it's not an assumption here that the decision boundary is linear. The fact that the decision boundary is linear follows from our assumption that the covariances are the same. Whenever the true covariances are the same, the, the optimal decision boundary is a line. Okay, um, let's think a little bit about the role of this inverse sigma term or factor in here. So in fact, one could think, like before doing any of this math, I could have asked you, what do you think is the best um, is the best decision boundary? And one could maybe naively think that, well, one can just project on the line that connects the two centroids of these classes. So let's say that's the same picture, that's the same two Gaussians. Here's my mu1, here's my mu2. So imagine I didn't have sigma in the inverse of sigma. Let's just, let's just pretend it's not here. Then this will be the difference mu1 minus, minus, minus mu2, sorry. And this is the line orthogonal to it, and this would be our decision boundary. And it's clear that it's not actually very good, right? I mean, it will classify points here correctly, points here also correctly, but like points over here, they are on the wrong side of the decision boundary. They're actually more likely to come from this Gaussian than from this Gaussian. And what happens here with this, in the, 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 the the, with this factor is that it corrects for the covariances. I mean, the point, the why is this wrong is because the covariance is stretched in this direction. So we need to account for that. That's what this does. And this actually then finds some other vector here, and the decision boundary is orthogonal to that, and that's a much better decision boundary that separates these Gaussians, obviously much better in this particular case. So it works out. I think it's intuitive, and the math works out great. So I said that, I, I have just said that it's the fact that covariances are stretched in a particular direction that makes it not always optimal to just use the line connecting two centroids and the orthogonal to that as a decision boundary. But in some cases it may be optimal and the, re the, the condition for that is of course that the covariances or one of the conditions for that is that the covariances are just not stretched in any direction. They are just spherical. So whenever the covariance matrix is proportional to the identity matrix, which means it's a diagonal matrix and it has sigma, 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 sigma squared, the same value 
everywhere on the diagonal. This is called a spherical covariance matrix. And uh, in this case, linear discriminant analysis reduces, in fact, to something that is sometimes called nearest centroid classifier. So let's look at the picture here. So now here are my spherical covariance matrices, right? It's just a circle in two dimensions. It can be large, it can be small, depending on the, on the size of this variance, but it's just a circle. And now I have those two. And of course, here you don't need to correct for, you don't need the term inverse sigma. Why? Because the inverse of identity matrix is just identity matrix. So it doesn't, it doesn't add anything here. And you get the decision boundary that, it's, that, that is orthogonal to the line connecting the centroids, which also means that if you want to classify the point, let's say here, you want to classify that point, well, it's on the right side of the decision boundary, but you can equivalently say, you just look at the distances to this centroid and to this centroid, and whenever you just pick the class which is closer, which in, in a sense that the center, the centroid of this class is closer, the mean, right? And for this point, it will be that class. So it's, it's the same rule, the, the decision rule is the same as this uh, decision boundary. There's one little difference here though, is that when you say, when people talk about nearest centroid classifier, this is non-probabilistic then decision rule. It just, it just says you have your point, you know where the class means is, you measure the distance from your point to class means, you choose the one with the smallest, um, with the smallest distance just gives you then the, the, the answer which class it is, or your guess, your best guess, but doesn't tell you what the probability is that it's in this class versus another class. The spherical LDA, so LDA with assumption of the spherical covariance matrix, is equivalent in the sense that it will make the same uh, prediction, but actually it will allow you to compute the probability through exactly the same machinery with a bias rule and everything, you just need to plug this particular sigma in there. So maybe maybe it's not exactly correct to say that it reduces to it, but in some sense it does in terms of the binary prediction it does. Under the assumption that the priors are the same, right? If the priors were different, then it, the line would still be orthogonal, but it would shift. It would it would it would not cross this line in the in the middle. So this it's in the middle only because the priors for both classes are 50%. If it's much more likely that the points are from this class, because this class is much more numerous, then the decision boundary will move in that direction. And this will not be near a centroid classifier anymore. So that's, in fact, another difference here. Okay, and I point, put this spherical LDA in quotes because this is not, I think, a standard term, but one could call it like that. Okay, so far, everything that I said about QDA, LDA, spherical LDA, whatever, all of that assumed that we know what the true covariance and the true means and also the true priors are for each class. Of course, in any real situation, you don't know that. You observe some data, some training data, you want to fit the model on the training data, you don't know a priori what the sigmas and the mu's and the pi's are. So. How to do with that? Well, you can, you can estimate, or you have to estimate all these parameters looking at your training data, right? And this is, so I didn't mention that because it's almost, because it's very easy. We're just using the standard formulas for estimating the parameters of a Gaussian uh, probability density. So if you have a bunch of points that belong, you know that they belong to one class, let's say to class one, that's the training data, so you know that they belong to class one. You're just fitting Gaussian to them. That's all. So you're fitting the, the mean as the average. That's just the maximum likely estimate of that, right? We talked about, uh, about that in previous lectures, and you did the exercises about that. And we also fit the covariance as just summing the squared deviations from the mean and uh, averaging them. So this can be either without minus one, this, then this is the maximum likely estimate of the covariance or it, one can correct the bias by subtracting one. This actually doesn't matter for today's lecture very much. You just estimate the covariance of this Gaussian and then you use, so that's why I'm putting hat here because this is an estimate giving the training data and then you use these values with the hat in all the formulas that I had in the previous slides to compute your prediction for the test data. There's one ingredient still missing and this is the prior but this is in fact the simplest thing to, to compute 
if there are two classes and you know that together your training set has maybe 1,000 points and let's say 600 of them are from class one and 400 are from class two, then you just estimate the, the prior of class one as 0 0.6 and the prior for class two is 0 0.4. It's as easy as that. So this will correspond, if you do this for each class, right, for the class one and for class two, then you're in the QDA situation. You will have two means, class one mean and class two mean, and you will have two sigmas, class one covariance matrix and class two covariance matrix. And of course, if you do this on the real data, even if in reality the covariances are the same, you will get some sample of points in class one and some sample of points in class two, and then you compute the empirical covariance matrices using this formula, and they will not be exactly identical. So you will have, even then, you will still have slightly quadratic uh, decision boundary if you're using the QDA. So if you want to use LDA, you have actually to estimate a slightly different object. You have to estimate single covariance matrix that describes both classes. So you can think about how to do it. And there's maybe one can do it a bit differently. So one can compute these two things and then average, for example, or somehow try to combine the sigmas in a different way. But here's the more direct way uh, to, to define it, and that's how it's usually done. This is called a pooled covariance matrix estimator. And pooled means that we pool points from both classes. We take all points from class one and take the squared deviations from the mean of class one, that's the inner sum here, and then we take all the points from class two and take the squared deviations of all points from the mean of class two, and then we just keep adding them together, right? That's why there's double sum, so we sum across both classes, pooled together, and then we normalize. And actually it turns out that if you want an unbiased estimate, you have to subtract not the one here, but the number of classes. But again, this is a small difference and it doesn't matter for us today. Right. Illustration. Here is some data in two dimensions. So here's a bunch of points that belong to class one, that's a training set, and here's a bunch of points that belong to class two. You can, of course, esti the estimating the mean, it's just the mean of these points, and this mean is the mean of those points, and here's the covariance of class one, and here's a different covariance of class two. Uh, so each is a two-dimensional symmetric matrix. You do slightly different thing in LDA, right? So this is the same formula as before, and this is an illustration of that. So you imagine that you subtracted the mean of this class from all the crosses. And then I'm plotting them here. So the mean is now zero because I subtracted the mean, right? And I have a bunch of these crosses here around zero. And then I take all these circles and I subtract their mean from, from all of them. Then this whole cloud also moves to the zero, or so you should imagine. So it starts overlapping with this entirely. And then I'm fitting one single covariance matrix to this cloud. And that's what it is in disguise. Because you're always subtracting the respective mean. So you can interpret this double sum here as just fitting the covariance matrix to this pooled cloud that has means subtracted. I hope this makes sense. And since you, you have two means that were subtracted, and not only one, you're subtracting two here and not one if you want an unbiased estimate. Okay, and that's it. So if you do this, and you can do, so let, 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 let me say that you can do this in principle, it doesn't matter if the true covariances are the same or not. Like if you, you make an assumption that true covariances are the same, and then you just compute the sigma, you can do this in principle, even like technically you can do it, even if the true covariances are very different, you will still get something, sigma, this will be the best covariance matrix, single covariance matrix that fits both classes in your training data. The best choice, the maximum likely choice. Okay, fine, so now I told you how you find the mu1, mu2 and the sigma and the pi's, the priors. And I told you the formula that you need to plug, or we derived the formula that you need to plug all of that in in order to get the prediction given an X point 
what's the probability that it belongs to class one and class two when if you say you are happy with drawing uh, with thresholding at a 50 percent then you have your your binary decision so that's the full um, story about LDA there's of course the problem that we discussed that we that we discussed a lot in previous lectures in different contexts and that is overfitting um, issues that you will be getting here because and I hope many of you already suspected that because we have this inverse of the covariance matrix term here right which is related to what we had in linear regression where there was also an inverse of this x transpose x term and we talked a lot about that back then, about how this inverse can cause numerical problems, especially if some singular values of x are small, which will always happen if your if your dimensionality is is large for your sample is somehow too large given your sample size, or to say the same thing the other way around, if your sample size is not large enough given your dimensionality, and you will actually run into into even worse problems that this formula will not even be computable if uh, dimensionality is larger than the number of points, right? So this causes overfitting because we are in the high variance regime, right? See previous lectures for all these discussions. But we can use exactly the same logic as we used before to deal with this, to tackle this here. So remember that and recall that in linear regression, we had this, yeah, as I said, this was the term. And for example, rich regularization, we defined rich regularization via penalty term and the loss function, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, it just meant that you plug lambda i inside the brackets over here and use the same formulas everywhere else, and it just works out. And this is the, the rich, um, the effect of the, um, of the reach penalty. So we can use the same here because here we have a problematic term that is inverse of some matrix so we can add some diagonal identity matrix with some little with some lambda factor and then take an inverse and this will fix the problems if this has small some small singular values or eigenvalues then after adding this it they will not be so small anymore so when you when you compute the inverse they will not explode so the variance uh, will not explode either, hopefully. So we can write the same thing a little bit differently, which is how it's usually done in, in, in the LDA discussions. A apart from writing sigma plus lambda i, I will insert this one minus lambda term here. So this allows for maybe a more natural interpretation, at least in this context, when lam lambda now changes only between zero and one. It doesn't go to, doesn't, cannot grow arbitrarily large. The, the range of possible lambdas is from 0 to 1. If lambda is 0, you are just not regularizing anything, right? It's just LDA. Lambda 0 means LDA. Lambda 1 means that you forget that you even had your sigma and you just have identity matrix, which corresponds to the spherical LDA, as I called it before. Basically corresponds to the nearest centroid classifier. So you can see this thing as interpolating between LDA, raw, vanilla LDA, and the nearest centroid classifier, or something that corresponds to it. And in the middle, you have this entire spectrum. So you can imagine, you can imagine doing cross-validation to choose the best lambda. You can imagine how the test curve will, will have large, will, will go up due to high variance in the LDA regime, so near lambda zero and how it will be large due to high bias in the nearest centroid regime, right? And it will have a sweet spot somewhere in the middle, um, which is where you want to be, and you need a test set or you need cross-validation to find this lambda. So that's exactly the same logic as always in this course. That's not the only thing you can do, though, here. You can interpolate you can interpolate different things using exactly the same logic or very similar logic. So here we're interpolating between LDA and the nearest centroid. But I can also say, well, why not interpolating between quadratic and linear discriminant analysis? So I, computing, I, I compute, imagine that you computed all the sigma k for each class, so two separate sigma k's, and you also compute a pooled estimate sigma, and then you're interpolating between these two things. It's still, it will be quadratic unless lambda is one, 
but it will become more and more and more linear, right? Your decision boundary will like straighten up and up and up and up until it becomes completely straight at lambda equals to one. And this may f may help uh, overfitting if you're in a regime where QDA overfits, but LDA is not, right? So there, there's actually some hierarchy of, of uh, model complexity here. QDA is the most complex model. LDA is simpler. Spherical LDA is even simpler. That's why you can move smoothly using these lambda terms from more complex model to more simple model um, and optimize that on your problem at hand. And actually, there's even more choices that one can, that one can write down here in this framework depending on how you model these two um, covariance matrices for the two classes. So there's two choices, like two orthogonal choices that you can make. The one choice is whether you assume that the covariances are the same, and another, cho another option is to say, so this would be the same, shared covariance matrix. Another choice would be to say, no, they can be different. Then I'm fitting two separate covariance matrices. And the second dimension here is how complicated the covariance matrix you allow for each of these classes. It can be no constraints, that's what I call a full covariance matrix. It can be diagonal covariance matrix, so zero off diagonal and just values on the diagonal but different values on the diagonal. Or it can be a spherical covariance matrix which has the same value everywhere on the diagonal. So this gives you six options. This is QDA, this is LDA, this is called diagonal LDA, and this is an actual term. People use it sometimes, diagonal LDA. This is the nearest centroid, almost, right? Here, you would get spherical QDA, which, is, which I've never seen this term in the literature, but I think it makes sense. Um, this means you assume that the covariances are different, but both are spherical. So maybe one class is like that, and another is like that. Fine. And finally, over here, you get something that you could call diagonal QDA, no, also not a term that I, that I see often, but this in fact has another name, and this is called naive bias. I will talk a bit about that on the next slide. Um, actually, these, these six models have some order on them in terms of which ones are more complex and which are more simple, right? So always when you go down, your complexity decreases, and if you go from here to the right, then your complexity also decreases. And assuming that the dimensionality is p, you, one can actually work out how many parameters these covariance models need in each of the cases. So I can tell you, for example, here there's only one parameter. In the bottom right, in bottom right exactly, you're fitting a spherical covariance matrix, just has one parameter, sigma, and it's the same in both classes, so that's one parameter. Um, as an exercise, you can think, you can count number of parameters in um, every other um, cell of this table. And another comment here is that one can regular, like one can interpolate between more complicated and less complicated models in any combination. So if you interpolate between LDA and the nearest centroid, that's usually what is called regularized LDA, but you can interpolate between QDA and LDA or in any other way possible. In principle, any, all of that would make sense. Okay, so I want to talk separately a little bit about this diagonal QDA situation, which is known as Gaussian, in this case, Gaussian naive bias. And naive bias is a more general term that can be used in non-Gaussian situations, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Just want to introduce the concept of what naive bias means, because you might, um, you might hear this term often in, in some applied context. So when we're doing, but remember that this is just diagonal QDA, it's not a new concept. It's just QDA with covariance matrix here being diagonal, here being diagonal, but possibly different in two different classes. What it means is that all correlations between all features within class correlations are assumed to be zero. So we're ignoring the correlations. And that, of course, simplifies everything by a lot. Because what happens is that the probability density Fk of x of class k actually decomposes into the product of marginal probabilities for each coordinate. So if you have a Gaussian that has no correlation, then it's a product 
of a Gaussian over coordinate 1 and a Gaussian over coordinate 2. It gives you a two-dimensional Gaussian. So here it's written down as an exercise, but it's a very simple exercise. One just has to check that the probability density here, under the assumption that the sigma is a diagonal matrix, can be actually written as a product of univariate Gaussians centered around the respective component of mu and with variance, which is the respective component of sigma. That's a very easy exercise. So here's how it looks. If you have a diagonal covariance matrix, that's what I, what I tried to say before, right? So diagonal covariance does not mean that this is somehow diagonal here. Diagonal covariance means that if you imagine covariance matrix, that is a two by two matrix, it has variance of x1 and variance of x2 on the diagonal, and the covariance between x1 and x2 off diagonal. So this covariance is zero, means that this is actually not stretched in the diagonal direction at all. And that's called diagonal covariance matrix. And this is a product of these two marginal uh, densities that you get if you project your entire data on x1 or you project the entire data on x2. So here's just, as a, for comparison, if you have a non-diagonal covariance matrix that has some correlation, then the marginal densities are still Gaussian because if you take a Gaussian project anywhere linearly, you still get a Gaussian distribution, con very convenient property of a Gaussian. So the marginal here is a Gaussian and here it's also a Gaussian, but this is not a product of these two, right? Because if you take the product of these two, you still don't know how it should be oriented. Or in other, if you take the product of these two, you will get something that is not, uh, that doesn't have any correlation. That's the, the, the better way to, to phrase that. Okay, and now, naive bias is the, the QDA classification that arises if you have two classes with two covariances and they are both diagonal but they're not necessarily the same. So here's my class one, here's class two. Each can be decomposed, so to say, in these two projections, this one and this one. And now if you want to classify this point, or in fact even not compute the probability that this point belongs to class one, for example, then you can just look at the coordinate over here and compute the probability that it belongs to this class in this one-dimensional situation, and then compute the probability that it belongs to this class in this one-dimensional situation. Then you just multiply these two probabilities and that's it. This gives you the correct two-dimensional probability that it belongs to this class. So all computations can be done univariately, right? You don't need to take care of the, you don't need to actually think about the covariance matrix at all here. You just need to have these individual variances of individual features within each class. You, you can erase this two-dimensional picture and just keep these one-dimensional pictures for each, for each feature. So that's very fast to compute. This will not overfit. This may have high bias. Um, but this will have low variance, can be in some situations actually very practical. That's why it's called naive, right? Because it ignores actually all the correlations that may be in the data um, by just assuming that covariance matrices are diagonal. Um, right, if you think about the decision boundary here, it will not be linear. Just want to say one thing, because this is still QDA, right? So if you work out the decision boundary, it will still be some, so in this case, for example, it will probably go like that and then curve here. All right. Now, to something slightly different. In fact, there's a whole parallel or different way to derive the LDA. And depending on the textbook you pick, you may see that you may see LDA introduced, as I just did, until now, and then later this part is mentioned. But in some cases you will see the, uh, it the other way around. It will introduce like I will now describe, and then later the connection is made to all this probabilistic stuff and bias theorem from before. So there's two different ways to look at LDA arriving to the same thing, and this was probably the more, the historically the first the first thing, so LDA is also sometimes, you will see the term Fisher's discriminant analysis or Fisher's linear discriminant. 
all of that means exactly the same thing. And what Fisher did originally to, to derive essentially LDA um, was, was a very different picture. So he asked this, the, this, the, the following question. He posed the following problem. Imagine that you have two classes. Imagine that you assume that the covariance is the same, right? This is the same assumption as before. Now, let's try to find a good pro linear projection of the data. So we can project this data linearly on a line. Line can be here, or it can be here, can be anything. What is a good one-dimensional projection in terms of separating the two classes from each other? So we want to find the projection such that when you project all the data, the classes are as separate as possible. How we need to quantify what it means for the classes on, in one dimension to be as separate as possible. And the definition that, that Fisher used there was to somehow measure the between class spread, how far the classes are from each other, and then measure how much variance the classes have, that's called the within class spread, and then take the ratio. The higher the ratio, the better, because the high we want the between class spread be high and within class spread be low. This contributes, both things contribute to the high ratio, right? So here's one way to, to define that. So let the means, so you imagine that you projected everything to one dimension and now you just have one dimensional quantities uh, instead of the vectors. So you have the mean of class one, the mean of class two, and you have some variance over here. I will denote S as just sum of square deviations and then divided by the sample uh, and the same here. And then here's the Fisher's ratio. We have a square difference between the means, the further the means are from each other, the higher the numerator, and then we have the sum of the um, sum of squared deviations from the respective mean in the denominator. And now, with a little bit of algebra, one can, or calculus, one can find the solution to that. So what is the best direction to achieve that? So I put a star over here, oops, sorry, a star over there, because I don't want to, uh, to explain all the steps mathematically in, in much detail. Maybe we'll talk about that in the exercise time. I will just briefly go over that to, to give you an idea of how it works. So if I denote by W the, the direction, so the axis on which I project the data, then I can rewrite this term like that. So I have here the M1 is just the projection of the move vector on the W, and we have the square of that. And in the bottom, I'm using the same sigma as I defined before. That's the pooled covariance matrix. And you can uh, easily convince yourself that if you compute this term over here, so you multiply it with W on the right and with W transpose on the left, you get a number that's the same number as here up to normalization context constant over here. That's why I'm writing proportional and not equal. So here you just don't see this W. Here you see the W and the question is what is the W that maximizes this uh, term? So how do you solve that? Well, there's a trick that's actually very useful whenever you deal with, with problems like that. So I want to mention that you make a change of variables. You say, here it's not obvious what is the best W because this denominator is somehow complex. So let's introduce a different variable called V that is sig square root of sigma. Square root, you can always, if you have a matrix that is uh, positive definite that has all the uh, singular values positive, you can define the square root as the same matrix where all the singular values are the square roots of the, uh, of the original singular values. And then the square of this matrix, so this op times itself, will be just sigma. Okay, so we define V like that, then we plug everything in here, and now in the denominator we just get the norm of V. So that's very convenient, because here we can see directly that if you multiply v by any constant, then you will get this constant squared above and the constant squared below, so it will cancel. So actually the length of v doesn't matter, so we can choose any length of v that we want. We can choose length one. If we choose the length one, then the, we can just erase that because this is just one. And then we want to maximize the length of v times a given vector. And that's of course will be maximized if v points in the direction of this very vector, which just means 
So that's a long explanation, but actually a pretty obvious then result is that the V should be proportional to this thing over here. And now we need W, right? So we need to convert V into W using this formula, and you get the same thing as before. That's a very short um, explanation of how, in fact, it turns out, again, not obvious, but in a priori, but it turns out that if you want to maximize this ratio um, of class separability, then you derive the exactly the same thing that we had before uh, that followed from a very different logic in LDA. Here's an example, just an intuitive, uh, intuitive explanation. So here are, are the two Gaussians, the covariances assume the same, and now just think about what happens if you project this into different directions. So if you project here, for example, here's the one mean, here is another mean, and the, cov the variances are pretty large, right? So here, the separability between these two classes, according to the Fisher's definition, will be rather low because you're dividing by large variances. Whereas the optimal projection is around here, and if you project here, it may even be that the distance between the means will be a bit smaller, but the covariances will be a lot smaller in this direction, so the class separability so between this Gaussian and this Gaussian the separability will be larger, which is what the Fisher's criterion is after, right? Okay. A comment on the uh, discriminant analysis versus logistic regression, and we're approaching the end. The, um, these are two linear methods. They are both popular. You can, in practice, uh, see both of them applied very often one should always remember when, when doing them, when, when applying them, that there can be overfitting issues in both, and you can regularize both um, by in, in different ways, but for example, with the reach penalty that can be applied to logistic regression and to LDA. So whenever you do this in practice, please make sure to regularize, to cross-validate, to somehow choose the best regularization. And if you do all that, then in practice, very often, there's not much difference between LDA and logistic regression. Both can give you the probability, probabilistic predictions uh, if you want them. Both with a threshold can give you binary predictions if that's what you want. The performance, you can find some situations where the performance is very different, but usually it will not. Or at least often, often it will not. So nevertheless, one can say the following. If the data are truly Gaussian, then linear discriminant analysis is provably optimal. In fact, we just proved it. If the data are Gaussian and the covariances are the same, then you cannot do better than LDA. It just follows from the, from the Bayes rule, and that gives you the best possible linear classifier. Of course, the catch is that if the data are not really Gaussian, then anything can happen with LDA in principle, right? And logistic regression does not do this assumption. So if the data are strongly on Gaussian, logistic regression can perform better, can outperform LDA. An example of that would be if the data maybe are kind of Gaussian, but you can have outliers in the data. And an outlier to your, like you have a nice Gaussian over here and an outlier over there, this will completely screw your estimate of the covariance matrix. LDA will start performing well, bad, right? Uh, but, in the L but in logistic regression, it could be that nothing much happens, it still performs well. But of course, the data can also be completely non-Gaussian, have completely non-Gaussian shape without outliers. And there, too, like LDA can surprisingly, can perform surprisingly well, even given non-Gaussian data. But I think most people would agree that logistic regression is probably the best first choice, because it doesn't need this additional assumption. And you don't lose that much. Even if the data are close to Gaussian, logistic regression is still will be pretty good. Um, so not much is lost, and it's a safer option. Final slide is that I just want to mention something not nonlinear in the end. So I, I introduced, the, I, I, we talked about the nearest centroid classifier before, right? So here's, here's some example for you. Let's talk about this picture. So here's one class, the crosses. Here's another class, the circles. This point denotes the mean of the circle class, and this point denotes the mean of the cross class. And let's say your test point is somewhere over here. Well, it's closer to here 
so it will be classified as a cross, right? But of course, this is only this only makes sense if you if you assume that the data are Gaussian and spherical, and here they are obviously not spherical, not even Gaussian, and in fact the point here is most likely a circle, right? Because the circle class has this um, has this shape. So an alternative idea, but kind of I think conceptually not that far from from looking to which class centroid is closer, is to say, well, which actually, which um, class are the points that are neighbors of my test point? So let's say my test point is here where my fingertip is, then I'm finding several nearest neighbors, let's say four, in this case it will be this point, this point, this point, and that point over there, I encircle them, so I found four nearest neighbors, and among these four nearest neighbors, three are circles, well then I classify it as a circle. Okay, so that's called K nearest neighbor. Classify it super simple, um, but it actually can be super effective in, um, in, in, in very different situations and can be uh, also a good first choice, often. The value of K here, so you have K nearest neighbors, you can have one nearest neighbor, you can have 10 nearest neighbor, you can have 100 nearest neighbor classifier, so the value of K sort of controls the position on the bias variance trade-off. If you, if you have k equal 1, that's a high variance situation because you can imagine the decision boundary, if you draw the decision boundary here with k equal 1, it will like go around all the crosses, right, here. So it will, it will be prone to, to, to overfitting the noise in the data. Whereas if your k is large, then it will rather be a high bias situation. So you can see k as a regular, it's not a regularization parameter, it just directly controls the complexity of the model, so you can tune the K by cross-validation or by applying it to a test set. Several comments about that. This is a so-called non-parametric method. So this is the first non-parametric method um, that, uh, that we encounter in this course. This means that we don't, in some sense, we are not building any model. We are not... Um, we, uh, we are not... We're not fitting any parameters, right? That's what not parametric means. We don't have parameters. We have, if we want to make a prediction for a test point, we just need to find the neighbors in the, in the training set, which means that we have to hold the entire training set available at the test time. It's not that we fit the model on the training data, we can forget about the training data, we have our model parameters and we apply it to the test. This won't work here. here you don't have model parameters, you just have your training data, you have a query point, you find the neighbors in the training data, uh, this gives you your prediction. Interestingly, though, or nevertheless, it can be given a probabilistic interpretation pretty similar to the, to the one we were developing in this lecture, because you can view this nearest neighbor thing as uh, constructing a non-parametric estimate of this probability of x given the class uh, K. So this is also something I will leave as an exercise, but it's pretty, pretty simple to see that if you, if you found your, if you, if you say, well, I will look at um, some amount of nearest neighbors, let's say in this case four nearest neighbors is in this picture, and I will denote by C K the number of points among these nearest neighbors that belong to class K, right? And N K is as before, the number of points in this class overall in the entire training set, then this fraction, so let's say I overall have 10 points, 10 circles, and 10 crosses, and here I get three circles and only one cross. Um, this means that the probability is three times larger that it belongs to the, to the circle, that it came from the circle class than that it came from the, from the cross class. So one can I think when, when using nearest neighbor classifier, people usually don't think about probabilities. Rather, they just say, we take the majority vote of the 10 nearest neighbors and that's it. But in principle, one can say, well, if you're taking the 10 nearest neighbors, you, the, you, you, are, you are making a probabilistic prediction. If it's 7 out of 10, then it's 70%. That's the likelihood. You can still multiply it with the prior, if you want, to get the posterior. Um, so this is this is... This doesn't fit the LDA story, right? This is not parametric method. The decision boundary is not linear. It's not quadratic. It's not parametric. Um, some function that just depends on the training set directly. 
All right. Thank you.